Well, we are mixing it up this summer uh, through July. We have guest uh, speakers coming in. I want to introduce to you in just a moment our preacher for the day. But I want to, first off, uh, thank you for being here and uh, to welcome you into worship and to welcome you into the story. Uh, We have been telling the story of David throughout the summer. For 10 weeks, we're going to be really immersed in the highs and the lows of one of the greatest leaders, uh, the man that the Bible describes as a man after God's own heart. But as we will see today, uh, it is not all high and it's not all low. There's, there's, there's both extremes. And today is uh, the, the really one of the lows, one of the low points in the story. Uh, and so it's a little bit of a challenging uh, job to assign somebody a story like this, Jay, and then say, hey, come uh, introduce yourself to these people and to like be a guest preacher. So it's a big task, but Jay's up for it. I want to invite Jay Smith forward. Let's welcome him. And uh, as a way of introduction, I've known, uh, I've known Jay for 20, somebody asked me, I think it's been 25 years. I was a student at Kentucky Wesleyan College and went to chapel one day. Jay was the uh, preacher at Wesleyan Heights United Methodist Church and came in and spoke at chapel. And I still remember what he talked about. So that says, a lot, uh, my memory's not good. So it says a lot, a lot about him. Uh, and, uh, and really maybe as a way of introduction, Jay is our new district superintendent, which is um, in the Methodist w- way, way of doing, doing church, we weave community into our organization. I mean, there are a lot of ways of looking at higher, you know, different levels of church, but we, we weave connection and community into how we do church at, at multiple levels. So we have people overseeing us and helping us and guiding us. And Jay has just taken on that role. So we want to thank you for that and welcome you in that way as well. And we're going to do all we can to support you as you bring this challenging story to us. So how's that for a setup? That's perfect. That's perfect, man. Um, are we good? Uh, good morning, first of all. Good morning to you. Uh, as you probably know, one of the oldest greetings in the scriptures uh, that Christians exchange with each other is grace and peace. And if you should feel the same way toward me, you just say, and also with you, grace and peace of the Lord be with you. I'm really glad you feel that way. Uh, I am a district superintendent, and uh, you're never quite sure what the reception is going to be on any given day or in any good given gathering, but It is good to be with you uh, today. Uh, I do bring you greetings, first of all, on behalf of our bishop. Bishop Leonard Fairley would be thrilled uh, for me to greet you and to see you today and to thank you for being here. But not just that, but continuing to be the light of Christ in this community and beyond. This is a wonderful, wonderful church. Some of you know I pastored across town a little bit uh, for seven years at State Street, and so I was in a group with Adam and your staff here at this church. I don't have to tell you, you are so blessed. I mean, Adam, he preaches, he sings, he plays the keyboard. It's, I hate pastors like him. I can't, it's just (laughs) awful. It's horrible. But he and Laura and Joe and Lou and I'm going to leave somebody out, Christy. I see Ken and Brother Coomer and familiar faces. I feel at home here today, and I'm, I'm grateful for the privilege. Us preacher types, to have another preacher invite you to preach in their pulpit is a big deal. You may not realize that, but among preachers, that's a big deal. And so I don't take this opportunity lightly. And I'm grateful uh, to greet you and to be with you. I do greet you on behalf of the rest of the district. I went from nine counties to 22 counties in Kentucky. I need your prayers. I appreciate your prayers. Uh, But I I love it. I love being in churches. I love being with pastors and church leaders. And so most days I'm very thankful. Most days I'm very thankful for what God has called me to do in this season. So it is a joy and privilege. We are... uh, Continuing to look at the life of David, I've gone back and looked at some of the sermons. What a great series this is for the summer. And uh, I do appreciate being given the hardest passage in the the series, so I'm grateful for that. Actually, I I do love texts like this, and I'll say more about that uh, in the sermon itself, and I'm grateful for this passage. But today's reading, if you have a, a Bible and want to follow along, 2 Samuel 11 verses 1 to 17 and verse 26 to 27. And if, uh, if you are able, would you mind to please stand and, and honor the reading of God's holy word at this time? 
And listen now for the word of the Lord. In the spring when kings went off to war, David sent Joab along with his servants and all the Israelites, and they destroyed the Ammonites, attacking the city of Rabbah. But David remained in Jerusalem. One evening, David got up from his couch and was pacing back and forth on the roof of the palace. From the roof, he saw a woman bathing. The woman was very beautiful. David sent someone and inquired about the woman. The report came back, Isn't this Eliam's daughter... Bathsheba, the wife of Uriah the Hittite. So David sent messengers to take her. And when, he, when she came to him, he laid with her. Then she returned home. The woman conceived. And she sent word to David that she was pregnant. Then David sent a message to Joab. Send me Uriah the Hittite. So Joab sent Uriah to David. When Uriah came to him, David asked about the welfare of Joab and the army and how the battle was going. Then David told Uriah, Go down to your house and wash your feet. Uriah left the palace, and a gift from the king was sent after him. However, Uriah slept at the palace entrance with his master's servants. He didn't go down to his own house. David was told Uriah didn't go down to his own house. So David asked Uriah, haven't you just returned from a journey? Why didn't you go home? And Uriah told David, The chest and Israel and Judah are all living in tents, and my master Joab and my master's troops are camping in the open field. How could I go home and eat and drink and lay with my wife? I swear on your very life, I will not do that. Then David told Uriah, Stay here one more day. Tomorrow I'll send you back. So Uriah stayed in Jerusalem that day. The next day, David called for him, and he ate and drank, and David got him drunk. In the evening, Uriah went out to sleep in the same place alongside his master's servants, but he did not go down to his own home. The next morning, David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it with Uriah. He wrote in the letter, Place Uriah at the front of the fiercest battle, and then pull back from him so that he will be struck down and die. So as Joab was attacking the city, he put Uriah in the place where he knew there were, there were strong warriors. When the city's soldiers came out and attacked Joab, some of the people from David's army fell. Uriah the Hittite was also killed. When Uriah's wife heard that her husband Uriah was dead, she mourned for her husband. And after the time of mourning was over, David sent for her and brought her back to his house. She became his wife and bore him a son. But what David had done was evil in the Lord's eyes. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks, and thanks be to God. May be seated. I hope it would not sound too sacrilegious, but for me, the first and obvious question when I come across this story, is who in the world left this in the Bible? I mean, this is David. Magnificent King David. I have a little Bible pop quiz for you. I know it's unfair on a Sunday morning, cloudy Sunday morning, to give you a pop quiz, but it's an easy Bible quiz. Here's the Bible quiz. Who is the boy who defeated Goliath, the greatest of all the Philistine warriors, with just a slingshot and some rocks? Who was the shepherd boy who became king over all of Israel? Who was considered to be the greatest of all the kings of Israel? Who was the king that by which all other kings of Israel would be judged? And when Jesus Christ the Savior of the world was born in Bethlehem. He was born in Bethlehem because, we're told, he was of the house and lineage of David. So I think it's an honest and a fair question to begin and just say, who left 
this story in the Bible. Just a show of hands, if you were at Vacation Bible School any time in your life or have helped with Vacation Bible School, have you ever heard the story of David and Bathsheba at Vacation Bible School? No. And rightly so. I mean, let's just count it off. The offenses. Sexual assault. Cover-up. Conspiracy to commit murder and murder. I mean, can you imagine? Can you imagine today the bidding war between Netflix and Prime Video and HBO Max for the streaming rights of this miniseries? Can you imagine the headlines? I mean, social media would have exploded. King David goes down the drain over bathing beauty. The Beauty and the Beast. For my personal favorite, this will date me some. Some of you will know what we're talking about. If you don't, just ask your mom, ask your grandparents. My personal favorite, Bathwater Gate. I mean, think about it. Let's be serious. The, the House and the Senate hearings, would they ever end? How? Can help me? How did this story get left in the Bible? Some of you may know the writer of Chronicles. Chronicles chronicles Samuel. It follows Samuel chapter by chapter, but there is a story missing in Chronicles. Guess which story is missing? This one. My hunch is the writer of Chronicles who had such deference to King David, such love and respect, he just couldn't, I'm not going to put that story in here. Those of you that have small children, they probably have one of those early reader Bibles. You're not going to find this story in their bedtime story, and rightly so. This this is the most beloved king, right? In all of Israel's history, King David, the man, the myth, the legend. And historically, many have struggled. Many have struggled with what do you do with this part of the story? Some. Some have blamed Bathsheba. She knew if she bathed on the roof, the king would see her. She seduced him. Some have interpreted. Let me be let me be really, really clear at this point. Nowhere, nowhere in Scripture does any writer ever, ever implicate Bathsheba. This, this is not a story about adultery. This is a story of sexual assault on David's part. Some of the rabbis through the ages, some of the rabbis used to try and justify David's actions of setting Uriah up to be killed. They, they, would, they would argue by disobeying David's order to go to his house, Uriah was rebelling against royal authority and therefore guilty of treason. My personal favorite interpretation, it was by a scholar by the name of Cohen. It came out Several years ago, he relates David's experience to a midlife crisis. It's a psychological slant. He, he wrote this, David felt that his loss of mature powers with its consequent blows to his self-esteem struck at the center of his being, his masculinity. Thus, he had to reassure himself of his manliness, his strength, his power. David is a victim of retirement neurosis. Retirement, neuro, some of you are retired. I'm not going to get into your neurosi. Retirement neurosis? David's a victim? Friends, it's hard. It's hard for any of us who would admire David then and now to acknowledge that this part of the story, this part of the story, we just have to face it, it's an all systems Failure on David's part. 
I don't know if you lost count or not, in the 15 verses, David basically breaks nearly every one of the Ten Commandments in 15 verses. I don't know, maybe folks who want to make excuses for David, maybe they're like those of us who want to protect our heroes. What's that saying? Don't ever meet your heroes, right? I had a, I had a good friend in grade school. Was actually, his name was Jimmy Carter, not the former president, but his name was Jimmy Carter. And, and Jimmy loved the Cincinnati Reds. And we were in grade school in the 70s. What was going on in Cincinnati during the 70s? The, the big... They got a little machine going right now, but this was, this was the big red machine, and you can rattle them off, some of you, Pete Rose and George Foster and Ken Griffey Sr. and my sister, who knew we were an Atlanta Braves family. My father made it very clear we were Braves fans in this household. She had committed major league fan adultery. She had a poster of Dave Concepcion the shortstop of the big red machine on the wall in her room. And then, of course, when the jerseys were passed out, everybody wanted the same jersey. You hope the coach lets you pick your number first because everybody in Little League at that time wanted number five. Who's number five? Number five was Johnny Bench. My friend Jimmy was in an airport and he was so excited. He, I'm not going to tell you which of these legends. They're in the Hall of Fame. I'm not going to tell you which. I won't embarrass this individual. But he saw his, his idol, his hero, and he went over to this member of the big red machine, and he asked for an autograph. And he refused. He blew him off. And Jimmy, like, man, I just wish I'd never even had seen him. So I don't know. I don't, I don't know. Perhaps those who want to make excuses for David, they simply cannot bear to see their hero fall. But he falls. He falls in every way. And if we are objective and if we are honest, there is no excuse for David's behavior. There are None of his actions can be rationalized away. None of them. Something, something in this passage has changed. Something is deeply wrong with David. And the writer of 2 Samuel here in this 11th chapter, the very first verse, he gives us a heads up that things are going to take a terrible turn because in that first verse of the 11th chapter, 2 Samuel, in the spring, when kings go off to war, David sent Joab. Do you hear it? Where's David supposed to be going? What is he supposed to be doing? And it ends, that first verse ends with those tragic words, but David remained in Jerusalem. And if there was a movie score, if there were music underneath that reading, right at that point, David remained in Jerusalem, it would be these notes. Dun, 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 dun. Because David has taken a pass on the very reason that they wanted him to be king in the beginning. 1 Samuel 8, they say, we want a king. We want a king because we want someone like the others who will go out before us and fight our battles. And David was the man. And right here in this 11th chapter of 2 Samuel, he takes a patch. He stays back abdicating his role as leader and protector and defender of his people, the writer gives us a heads up that something very, very bad is about to happen, and it does. It's so tragic. If he'd just not stayed in Jerusalem, but he stayed in Jerusalem and he's pacing, strolling out on the roof, and we're told he sees a, a beautiful woman bathing, and it was lust at first sight. And because David can, he sins for her. 
He lays with her. And later he gets word that she's pregnant. And so David, of course, falls to his knees and repents, right? And asks the Lord, please forgive me. That's what happens, right? No. David, immediately, I've got it. I've got the perfect cover-up. Send for Uriah. Send him home. And he sends for Uriah, and Uriah comes back, and David says, look, how are things going? A little chit-chat. How's the battle going? How... How are things on the front line? And then he's like, uh, why don't, I want you to go home. You've been fighting the battles. I need you to just go home and be with your wife tonight. And Uriah, whose name means Yahweh is my life. The Lord is my life. Uriah refuses. To go down to his house. He's like, how can how can I find how can I take pleasure myself? My my comrade, they're they're in the fields, they're fighting the enemy. How could I possibly not on your not on your name, not on your life, David? Will I do this? And we see right there that the light of Yahweh, Uriah, the, the light of the Lord is as brilliant on Uriah as it is pathetically dim. In David. And when David finds out that Uriah did not go down to his house and sleep, the cover up is foiled. And so David, of course, repents, right? He drops to his knees. No, he, he takes another shot at it. He says, Look, you stay one more day. You stay here, and I'll send you back tomorrow. And he invites Uriah to come over. They have a meal, and he gets Uriah drunk. He's drunk, surely he won't even know what he's doing. He'll just go, go to his house. And I don't know if you noticed or not, even intoxicated, even drunk, Uriah has more character, more integrity, more honor before the Lord than David does right here. And he sleeps outside the palace gate doesn't go to his home. So David repents, right? David drops to his knees. Oh, he's desperate now. Who trained these soldiers? Who made them follow the Lord? <laughs> What's up with this? Can't even treat, trick one of his own soldiers. And so he's desperate now, and he sends a note. He sends a note, Uriah carries his own death sentence back to Joab. And the note, the note says, place Uriah at the front of the battle. Then pull back from him so he will be struck down and die. Among the many charges, I think conspiracy to commit murder would be one of them. And Joab, of course, does what King David orders him to do. And Joab is sent to the front lines in the fiercest part of the battle. And he's killed. What? What has happened to David? What has gone so tragically wrong with him? There's no need. In my mind, there's no need to overcomplicate this story. There's no need to overanalyze this story. Some of you know the familiar quote by Lord Acton, power. Power tends to corrupt and absolute power. Absolute power corrupts. Absolutely. David, that shepherd boy made king, he abuses in 15 verses every ounce of the God-given royal power. He abuses it in every way, plain and simple. He's the definition of what Wendell Berry calls supreme arrogance. Supreme arrogance is the determination to be responsible and answerable only to myself. 
And David, David has become secure in his own power. And he reveals, he reveals really that for some of us, for many of us, maybe failure isn't our greatest enemy. For some of us, for many of us, maybe success is our greatest enemy. Because when our strength and our power and our prosperity and our security, when you have everything and you are at the peak of your power, watch out. That's when you need to watch out. You see, I think what's happened to David is David has been king long enough to believe He's the king. You know what I mean? The worst thing, think about it, the worst thing really for any king is to start believing that you are the king. The worst thing for any queen, I want to leave the ladies out, any queen, the worst thing for any queen to do is to start believing that she is the queen. The worst thing for any CEO is to start believing, you know what? I'm, I'm the CEO, I'm the chief executive officer of this organization. Adam, you may disagree, but I, I would interject. The worst thing for a preacher, the worst thing for a preacher is to start believing I'm the preacher. You know who I am? And if I might add confessionally, the worst thing, the absolute worst thing for a district superintendent in the United Methodist Church is to start believing you're the district superintendent. You see, any any and all of us, we're in the danger zone whenever we feel secure in our own power. When any man or any woman believes he or she is somehow above the commandments, above the law, the rules no longer apply to me. Do you know who I am? Do you know who I am? That person Given, on, given time and opportunity, that person is a dangerous person. And will, will, write it down, will do harm to other people. Tragically, David, in this story, has ceased to be a man after God's own heart. He, he has become a man after his own desires, after his own passions, after his own wants. And there's no excuse for David here. No adequate way to rationalize what he has done. And this, this might be the most surprising thing that you might think I'm about, that, and I am a, I'm going to say it. This might be the most surprising thing, but I'm glad that this story was left in the David narrative in the Scriptures. You follow me? I'm glad this was left in the Bible. A week or so ago, I was traveling with my son. My son was going to a conference in Kansas City, and I was tagging along for the free hotel room and the internet because I, if I have my laptop and I got my phone, I can work from just about anywhere these days. And so I went with him to Kansas City, and on the way to Kansas City, there was this huge billboard, this huge billboard, and the letters just consuming that billboard were this. It was a question. Can you trust the Bible? And there was a phone number. I didn't call the phone number. I didn't need to call. I guess they were going to give me the answer to the question. I, I had the answer to the question myself. Can you trust the Bible? And the answer to that question for me is because of stories like this, yes, yes, we can trust the Bible. And the reason we can trust the Bible is that stories like the fall of King David were not left out of its pages. Does that make sense? The Bible 
can be trusted because the Bible isn't afraid to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help us, God. The Bible can be trusted because it presents the lives of people like David who were far from perfect, who were flawed and sinful, who strayed from God's path and sometimes committed godless acts in the name of God. The Bible can be trusted because the Bible doesn't present an airbrushed version of life a perfected and cleaned up version of who we are. It doesn't present a pristine, cleaned up Facebook version of who we want others to believe we are. The Bible can be trusted because it tells the truth, sometimes the ugly truth, who any and all of us are before the Almighty. So 2 Samuel 11 Thanks again, Adam, for giving me this. What are we to make of it? 2 Samuel 11, friends, is not just a cautionary tale for kings and queens, presidents and prime ministers. Rightly understood, I would say it's a cautionary tale for all of us, every single one of us, because all of us have power, We all have power. We all have influence. We all have gifts given by God to bless the world if we choose and to use those gifts to lift up life in this world. Or we can use them in self-centered and self-righteous and self-glorifying ways. You see, all of us This is the good and bad news. All of us are a mixture, aren't we? All of us. Our lives and our personalities are a mixture of good and evil, light and darkness, honey and vinegar, sweet and sour. None of us. None of us is exempt. And all of us, all of us, are we not in need of God's grace and God's mercy? I'm going to amen myself. I'm getting a little amen in the back. I like that. I like it. This is the best news of all. And why I'm glad this story is in the Bible. God offers mercy and grace to every single one of us. And the gift of confession is the doorway to that grace and that compassion. And this Lectio that we're using today is a, whoever I thank whoever picked it out, it's a psalm of confession that David, thankfully, at some point came to his senses and could write these words. You see, confession is God's reset. I don't know about you, if I can't get my phone to work right or the computer to work right or something in the house to work right, my go-to move is unplug it, shut it down, do a hard restart. And that's what confession is. It's just starting over, giving God the opportunity, a cosmic do-over at the ready. You see, David, King David, is not remembered, nor should he be. He's not revered, nor should he be, for the worst stretch in his life. The worst mistakes he has made. That is not what should should define David. It's not what should define any of us. And Bathsheba, the worst day of her life is not what should define her. And it doesn't, because you you know Bathsheba... There are four women in the genealogy of Jesus, our Lord. Four women. Three are named and one is referenced. Unfortunately, Bathsheba is the one that is referenced, Uriah's wife, in the genealogy of Jesus. And I love, I love what Dr. Will Gaffney, she talks about how Jesus was not just the son of David, he was the son of Bathsheba. 
And she says, God never requires our harm. God simply, in Bathsheba's life, God simply, listen to this, wove. God wove those ragged, frayed strands into something more beautiful than could have ever been imagined. And at the end of the day, at the end of our lives, no matter what we have done, no matter what we have not done, no matter what has been done to us or said about us, God's grace longs to turn it, to redeem it, to transform it, to bend it. to God's life-giving purposes in the world. One of my favorite quotes is by Anne Lamott. Anne Lamott says, God's grace always bats last. (laughs) I'm 60 years old. I'm 39 years in the ministry. You can take that to the bank, friends. God's grace always bats last. Frederick Beekner, he put it this way, the worst thing, I love this, the worst thing is never, it's never the last thing. Hang in there. God's grace is available. You see, by God's grace, David's worst days, Bathsheba's worst day, our worst days, never, have the last say. And what I mean by that is they never have the last say. I'm going to amen myself on that. Amen. Glory to God. So we're going to use this beautiful psalm. It's, It's not just for David, it's for us. Psalm 32. Once again, Let this psalm of confession, these words of David, speak where it needs to speak in your life. Let it have its redemptive way in your life. Don't let the worst day be the last day. Would you listen once again? David wrote, So I admitted my sin to you and did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Therefore, let all the faithful pray to you while you may be found. Surely the rising of the mighty waters will not reach them.